Whoa. All right, so this is on and it's not screaming. It started sounding like it was going to scream at us a little bit. So I'm going to turn it down. Okay. Well, we'll see if I have to do something different here or not. Well, I want to call us all together. I know some folks are still getting through the food line. Please make yourselves at home as, as I drone on about my, my time in Central America. Please feel free to get up and make yourself at home, get some more food. Everybody's pretty much from the parish, I think, but we have the restrooms are just outside this door in case you don't know. For those of you that came in from the front parking lot, we'll be able to go out the same way we came in. The doors lock after hours, but you can get out, just not in. So you'll just wander back out that way to get back out of the building. Uh, I would do a meal blessing, but I think we've kind of moved past that. <laughs> so we will go with that. You know, I do want to say a couple of quick things. So the Sarah Club is sponsoring tonight. Uh, and what I'll talk about is very much related to vocations, which is the nature of the Sarah Club. It's our North Idaho uh, organization that celebrates vocations, priestly vocations, religious vocations, the vocation of marriage, and just individual vocations as the banner over there says. I have the lights off here because we are live streaming and recording and I wanted everybody to be able to see what was going on on the screen. Lastly, I will point out over here on the right, so one of the people I'll highlight tonight, places I visited in January, was uh, Santiago Atitlan in Guatemala, which is where Blessed uh, Father Stanley Rother was killed. <clears throat> and we have a, a relic of Blessed Stanley Rother over here by these candles. Uh, the Sarah Club, through Bishop White Seminary, made it available tonight. So we will ask for Blessed Stanley's uh, support and prayers his intercession for us tonight as we get started. And with that, uh, there are a couple of us in Saren t-shirts. Feel free, there are ap membership applications in the back. It's a dues-paying organization. You join, you pay dues. Those dues are used by the, the committee then to support uh, people that are in the priesthood uh, and mostly seminarians in their, in their journey towards the priesthood and religious vocations, so also people uh, discerning women, discerning a religious vocation. So that's what's going on all there. So let's just begin, and I'm going to start with a prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we, as we rest here in you, we ask for your Spirit. We ask for your Spirit for open minds, open hearts, for the opportunity to listen to the story of of those that were called to Central America and during difficult times stayed there out of love for neighbor and ultimately, in many cases, sacrificed themselves for those neighbors. We ask you to give me the words that I will need this evening to make the story good, to make the story such that it gives glory to you. And blessed Stanley Rother, we ask for your intercession, both for for guidance in our own vocations and what our call is to life and for those discerning religious and priestly diaconal vocations. In your name we pray, amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so, you know, I put this slide at the beginning, uh, the grace of a stronger yes to my existence. So back in, like October-ish, we were thinking about going back down to Honduras, which is where we have the parish mission. St. Saint Thomas and St. Pius, Holy Family, this parish mission down there with a small village. But at the time when I was discerning whether to go or not, I had a call, I've had a call to visit the martyr sites in Central America where, where Archbishop Romero was killed and, and others along the way. And I just wanted to understand it more. I've read a lot about it, but reading is not the same as experiencing. So in October, I was 
pondering that, and so I took it to prayer, and then I took it somewhere else where good Catholics go to Google. <laughs> and, I, and I Googled it, you know, pilgrimage, Central America martyrs, and it turns out there was one. So uh, it popped up, and I ended up applying, and then, of course, went in January, and I'll talk more about that. But along the way, December, January, my spiritual director, oddly, as we were working through some things, he, he gave me guidance to pray for the grace of a stronger yes to my existence. And then there's a series of reflections and scripture passages to go with that. And it was providential of him, but it, and it's also a, a cautionary tale of be careful what you pray for, because going to Central America in January, it was clear to me then that I was being given all these examples of men and women who not only knew their existence, that knew their rootedness, their life and its origins uh, in Christ, but then they were also uh, willing to declare, testify, martyr to this great yes to that existence. So they knew who they were, or more appropriately, whose they were, and they said yes, and they continued to say yes out of love. So him giving me that grace to pray for and then that marrying up with the trip I took to me was, was uh, providential. And honestly, I'll talk about the trip, but afterwards it, it left me a little bit uh, quiet. So I've been still living through unpacking what all I saw and heard down there. The second piece follows on to that, which is this beautiful little definition of vocation. It's given by a 20th century theologian. And he had said, the place God calls you to is where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The place God calls you to, so your vocation, is that intersection of your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger. So when you know who you are, whose you are, once you get to that place where you really understand your, your life, and I speak of that in the Catholic sense, in a Christian sense, the divine life really that resides within and that we are fed by as many of you were there at Mass. When you understand that life, you say yes to that life, there is a deep joy and gladness. Not the same as the happiness the world can give and take away, but this joy and gladness that comes with the grace of the stronger yes. But then that gladness, that deep gladness, when you find where that intersects with the world's deep hunger, that's your vocation. That's where God's calling you. And for many of us, it'll be in those day-to-day -day mundane, if you will, activities of kindness, showing mercy to each other, forgiveness. Uh, it'll be in the jobs we have. It'll be as parents, grandparents. It'll be, you know, shepherding, walking with people that we know who are sick. All those things fit into this sort of definition. So I would say, for me, this became sort of the organizing uh, set of principles for me unpacking what I experienced in January and I just offer it here as a beginning to our own pilgrimage retreat uh, this evening for an hour or so. To pray for, to look for the grace of a stronger yes to your existence, and then to look where that, the gladness of that intersects with the world's hunger, with your neighbor's hunger, and uh, allow yourself to work in that space. Not everything will be as verbose as that, I assure you. So just briefly, so I did, I, I uh, ended up with the Marinole priests. They're, the Marinoles are over 100 years now, they've been sort of the missionary arm of the U.S. church, Catholic church. The top slide up there is on the left is Father John Spain pointing at this mural, and then on the right is Father Dave uh, Labuda. And then the mural itself, there's 44 uh, martyrs in, in the mural. I'll talk a little bit about it, where it's at later. But Father John still lives in San Sal El Salvador, San Salvador. He's been there since the early 70s. And uh, Dave Labuda now lives up here at one of the retirement facilities, I believe, for, for the Mary Knowles. But he ends up doing these immersive pilgrimages as well. The idea of these uh, pilgrimages are, is that there's firsthand testimony to the people, the times, and especially the martyrs, those who were killed. So the idea is to find first-hand testimony and experience in a very real way what happened you know, back in the 70s and 80s really predominantly. Then the bottom slide there is just our group. So I went with a diocesan clergy. They go every year. They've been doing it for 20 some odd years. 
So there's 14 priests from around the country and then six of us deacons that were on this journey led by Father John and, and Father Dave. And then there's a little map, map of, pardon me, a little map of Central America here showing Guatemala. So we really were Salvador and Guatemala is where we ended up spending time. Um, so Salvador and Guatemala, just a little bit of a grounding uh, on these two nations. So uh, Idaho is, I think, like 83,000 square miles. Uh, Guatemala would be about half that, so about half the size if you're looking at just land. And Salvador is like a tenth, right? So it would be about 8,000 square miles. Six million people crammed into Salvador uh, today. So you have six million people in an area about the tenth the size of Idaho, Guatemala, 17 million people, about half the size of Idaho. Guatemala, much bigger. Uh, instability would be kind of the key word, just politically. I won't go through the rest of the data really on these slides. The history of Central America is such that, you know, since the conquistadors really, there's, there's been just instability on instability and different, uh, you know, for a while, Yucatan and Chiapas and Mexico were part of Central America. Panama was part of Colombia, and it just kind of has ebbed and flowed. You had the, the uh, anyway, Guatemala uh, for a while was took up most of Central America. There's been efforts to make it a confederation, like European Union kind of thing, and that just has never taken. So it's remain, remained these handful of fairly weak uh, nation states down there that go through this constant turmoil. Uh, primarily, uh, you have a handful of families that run the show, and then you have the Ladinos in Guatemala, they call them Ladinos, which is people of European descent, and then you have the indigenous, primarily Mayan people, and a lot of the indigenous down there. So those are kind of the populations at play. And for, since the conquistadors, it's been fairly much like a feudal system or a caste system, whatever you'd want to say it. There's a handful of people at the top. So like in Salvador, it was 14 families on 90% of the land. Uh, in Guatemala, it's like 13, but just a handful of folks that own most of everything. And then a lot of poor people that are, <laughs> are incredibly poor. Um, and then you see towards the bottom there, it talks about the, the civil wars that I was down kind of visiting about. So 79 to 92 is the, what they bracket the civil war in Salvador. 75,000 non-combatants, these are non-combatants, 75,000 non-combatants killed, 8,000 disappeared, essentially dead. Guatemala, much higher even, so a longer span of time, 36 years, 200,000 killed and 50,000 disappeared uh, during those times. So just huge death counts of uh, the local folks over time. So as I went down to, uh, there's, there's three themes that I just kind of want to place out there that, that are at play. One was I just referred to, or in, talked about a little bit, the regional nature of it. So all of these countries, and this would be all of Latin American really, you end up with this haves and have nots. Uh, you have a handful of folks that have a lot, and you have a lot of folks that have nothing. And over time, that gets to a critical place and violence breaks out. Uh, so it's just the nature of the beast in a sense. Um, but that's the region, that's nature of the, the countries themselves. The church during this time, if you think about it, uh, what was happening in the early 60s, in the Catholic Church anyway? It was Vatican II. So Vatican II, Vatican II was coming about, John the Twenty Third saying, we need a new church, throw the doors open. Ad Gentis was one of the documents in the, in the council, and Ad Gentis to the nations, and it was all about missionary activity to the poor specifically. And in, in the church, a lot of dio dioceses up here in the developed countries sent people to the underdeveloped countries specifically as an outgrowth of Vatican II. So you have these nations getting to a critical place between the haves and have-nots, bordering on violence. Same time you have the church that's, that's kind of raised, <laughs> changing and beginning to, to travel to these countries with, with, in a sense, the idea of uh, raising the consciousness, letting people know that they don't have to be 
enslaved in a sense or poor, that there is more to life, that God wants them to have full lives, that God wants them to have the fullness of dignity that the image and likeness of God in them uh, desires or demands. So the church uh, is going through this great missionary sort of change. Uh, and so a lot of people flooded into, and we'll talk about several of them in, in this Central America, into Salvador and Guatemala. And like I said, then the third uh, that kind of plays into it a little bit, and you'll just see them as I talk through uh, people that, that talked to us when we were down there, was the internationalist sort of geopolitical thing. The other thing that's going on in all these times is the Cold War. So as the Cold War uh, moved forward, and then out of the 60s with Cuba becoming communist, you have the Sandinistas and Nicaragua and in 79, they finally take over there. There's this fear of communism, so you have the communists and the anti-communists battling it out sort of internationally, and that becomes the central point of that, becomes Central America. So communists versus anti-communists. And so these countries that are led by a handful of people that have all the power and the military might, uh, they, they had the ability to claim communist, 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 socialist. And, and because of that, it just ratcheted up the violence. Good or bad, the church wasn't there to say. To be honest with you, that was really clear as we, we visited. The church tried to take no stand in that. They, fought, they, they uh, talked about justice and dignity uh, and the freedom that comes with, with being a human being, uh, but not in a sense of political alignments or affiliations. So those three elements, the haves and the have-nots, Vatican II and missionaries and raising the consciousness of the poor, the desperately poor, and then this international communist, anti-communist thing were all going on, which created for just a, a, a tricky time we shall say, in just a time of incredible violence. And that even oversimplifies it. Honestly, the one thing that sat with me as I left was this is really complicated. It's really layered. And you'll see that again in some of the personalities that I, that I talk about. So this trip, so the first thing in Salvador, first week or so was Salvador and then in Guatemala. Uh, the first personality, if you will, that we, we talked about or met some people uh, was Oscar Romero. So everybody knows Oscar Romero was a was the Archbishop of Salvador. He became Archbishop in 1977. He was martyred then uh, in March, March 24th. So coming up on the anniversary now that I think about it, March 24th of 1980. So for those few years, he is from uh, Salvador, uh, grew up in Salvador, and uh, became Bishop there. He was, however, trained in Rome. He wasn't trained locally in seminary and stuff yet. A lot of his training was in Rome. So he was, so right away in his, in his episcopy when he became archbishop, there, he didn't have the fraternity with a lot of the priests in the country, the other bishops, quite honestly, because he was Rome trained. He, he was seen as conservative, and the oligarchs were really happy about seeing Archbishop Romero come into office because the oligarchs, the people in power, thought the church is going to stay a church of wealthy, uh, which is how it had been aligned for, for generations in a sense. <clears throat> so say they saw their interests, or his interests would probably align with theirs, and that relationship would be the same. Uh, but what they, what they missed with Archbishop Romero, as it turns out, his, his uh, motto for his archbishop, for his episcopy, was sentir con la iglesia. And sentir is kind of to feel, but it's feel, to perceive, to know, this idea of, of knowing, perceiving with the church. It was very similar to the idea of Vatican II where you heard the, the, one of the taglines was reading the signs of the times. So even Archbishop Romero, though he was conservative, he was bookish, he wouldn't have been seen as a person of the people necessarily or an archbishop of the people. The reality of him was that he was very much alive in the faith and was willing to connect with the people and pray with the people pray with the priests, all priests, and, and move the church forward according to the signs of the times. So people have tried now to pigeonhole him one way or another. He was this, he was that. The reality is, or what he had said at the time, and, and many authors say is, no, he lived out his motto, sentir con la iglesia. He went where the church went, church meaning the people of God, the poor primarily in, in El Salvador, which is why he ends up 
martyred. Uh, so being of one heart and one mind with the church was his, his sort of motto. And what got difficult on him was as he became archbishop when the violence increased, and specifically the one, one priest he was very close to was Rutilio Grande was his name, was martyred in uh, 1977 just after he became archbishop. And then just all the violence uh, against church members. Uh, archbishop Romero became convicted that we needed to stand up for the poor in the church. A couple of quotes out of a, there's a book, The Violence of Love, uh, just a series of his quotes. Faith consists in accepting God without asking him to account for things, according to our standard. Without asking him to account for things according to our standard. Faith consists in reacting before God as Mary did. I don't understand it, Lord, but let it be done according to your word. So he was always looking to God for God's word, for God's uh, will in things. And the way he did that was by interacting with the church, uh, everybody in the church. I'll tell some stories about that. Just another quick one, and this kind of summarizes where he got to in his, in his uh, role as archbishop. For the church, the many abuses of human life, liberty, dignity, are a heartfelt suffering. The church, entrusted with earth's glory, believes that in each person is the creator's image and that everyone who tramples it offends God. As holy defender of God's rights and of his images, the church must cry out. It takes as spittle in its face, as lashes on its back, as the cross in its passion, all that human beings suffer, even though they are unbelievers. They suffer as God's images. There is no dichotomy between man and God's image. Whoever tortures a human being, whoever abuses a human being, whoever outrages a human being, abuses God's image. And the church takes as its own the cross that martyred him. So just a couple of of quotes from him directly that talks about how how he was living out his his vocation as archbishop and what he came to uh, in that as sentir con la iglesia. So some of this we heard, we went and visited, this is Resurrection Parish, it's called Resurrection Parish, well now it's called St. Oscar Romero Parish, it was Resurrection Parish back in the day, and Father Joaquin uh, who was a seminarian underneath Archbishop Romero, traveled with him extensively and would serve with masses at him and that sort of thing. He didn't actually become a priest until after Oscar Romero's death and then Father John Spain again. So Father Joaquin spent some time with us uh, just going through some different stories. He first connected with him. Uh, Oscar Romero brought Curcio, some of us are Curcioistas, but brought Curcio to Salvador, uh, and Father Alvarez's parents were cruciistas under uh, Archbishop Romero. So that was kind of his early life connection with them. And you have this picture that is kind of a famous picture. I don't know, it, it floats around. You see it a lot of places, a couple of kids on Archbishop Romero's lap. Uh, Father Joaquin actually has, has met and known those kids now as, as older adults. It's just an interesting connection. Uh, but he was ordained, as I said, just after Archbishop Romero was killed. And he showed us the stole that was given to him with Archbishop Romero's motto on it, Sentir con la Iglesia. So he holds to that motto even now. So a few personal stories he told that kind of tell the story of Romero being, like I said, if he's going to perceive, look, feel with the church, he has to know the church, right? So how did he do that? In order, in, uh, so a couple of quick stories. One is that... Uh, he used to, every once in a while, the young guys would all go out to a pupuseria, which is just a little tienda, a little market, uh, to have a couple of beers and things. And Bishop, Archbishop Romero would actually dress down and kind of go incognito and go with them so that he wouldn't be recognized and, and he wouldn't become the celebrity of it all. But he would sit back and just listen to the dialogue and experience the people at these pupuseria. He wanted to enjoy being one, one of the people in a sense. And then he stole, stole the story of Bishop Uriosti, who was actually the adjunct bishop after uh, Romero. He was vicar general under Romero and then bishop after Romero was killed. But there's a story that Uriosti would tell that uh, they were in some leadership meeting with Romero and having conversations about what they were going to do about this, that, or the other thing. And they went to leave, and Romero kind of split off and went and was talking to uh, what seemed like a, a poor person, but like a street person or whatever, 
And so the assumption by everybody else was, well, he's ministering to this poor man, right? So they wandered over to talk to him after a bit and realized that he wasn't pastoring to this man at all or ministering to this man. He was asking the man the same questions he was asking all the priests in the meeting. He was asking for his input, his ideas, his thoughts on these leadership questions because he valued his opinion. He valued the people of El Salvador to the point that he was, he was willing to key off of them as, as a leader. Um, so a, a man sort of of the people in that sense so that he could move with the church forward in time to the point, yeah. So then another story he told was there was a, uh, a massacre, there was a protest in Plaza Libertad, but a big plaza there in, in uh, El Salvador, San Salvador. And things went bad, a lot of people were shot. Many people went into this uh, El Ros or, uh, Rosario uh, church, which was neighboring to the thing, and they took a, a National Guardsman with them, so they took a hostage. So Archbishop Romero and others get called out, and he's, he ends up in the church with these people, and he's trying to negotiate peace in this, this act. And uh, Father Alvarez said that he, Bishop Romero, Archbishop Romero knelt down in front of the Blessed Sacrament for like 30 minutes. Everybody else was nervous, scared, didn't know what to do, and he just went quiet and sat in prayer for like 30 minutes. And it just kind of shocked everybody. Um, but he sat and listened to our Lord uh, to gather the input, the ideas, to gather what he needed to then intercede and, and finish the negotiation, the mediation with, with the military. So whether it's being a man of the people or a man of prayer, again, Archbishop Romero was trying to, to move things forward in peace, always seeking reconciliation and peace between the, the, the factions that were at war with each other. Uh, and, and he just he told that, it was a beautiful story. So then they were not with Bishop, Archbishop Romero, he and another seminarian that day because Archbishop had sent them to a small village where some church people were assassinated to understand what happened. And so they went there and they came back and the Archbishop gave them some stuff to take somewhere else. He, uh, an autograph or a picture of himself, like an autograph picture, a megaphone, and then some documents from the church that they were to give to some women that worked for the church so that they had uh, bona fides as they went around and ministered in the communities so that if they got stopped by the military, they could show that, you know, they were there, uh, you know, working in a sense. So Romero was looking out for them, sent the seminarians on their way. But even at that, he, at that point, late, uh, apparently he had quit using anybody as tenants uh, to attend to him during Mass, whether the religious, the sisters, or these seminarians, he had quit using anybody because he realized that anybody being close to him uh, was at risk of, of being killed. He just he knew, it, he knew that the end was coming at some point. Um, so nobody was really serving with him uh, when he was shot in that sense. Uh, he was alone at the altar and had been. So those are just a couple of stories of Father Alvarez's uh, interactions with Archbishop Romero trying to think if there's anything else. So we went from talking to him at Resurrection Paris, we went to uh, the Archbishop's home, which is in this little religious community where there's a hospital and, and whatnot, uh, and to visit. And so there's, these are just a couple of pictures of his stuff, right? So they have all his stuff on display. It's a little bit of a museum, but it just shows how sparsely that he actually lived. Uh, I skipped over this too quick. So we enter into the, the houses here, and his bedroom was set up just like his bedroom had been set up. This is his little car he used to drive everywhere he went. Uh, you know, late, late in, uh, before he was killed, they offered him bodyguards and things, and his comment was, the people of, of Salvador don't have bodyguards. I don't, I don't want a bodyguard. Uh, he was going to live like the people to the end. And these are the vestments he was wearing. There's a bullet hole just here left of center, his left of center. Uh, it was a single shot that uh, entered just left of center and, and just kind of blew up on, on impact and took out a lot of his organs. But a very simple life, a very simple man. There's a tape recorder there where he recorded all his homilies uh, and just, yeah, some of his stuff. There was a bookcase and his vestments. There's a picture of Rutilio Grande on the wall here. Uh, and then right out front of that home is this little garden spot, <clears throat> which is interesting in that, so 
his body is in a tomb, I'll show you in a second, but his, apparently when, when he went to uh, the morgue, the mortuary, whatever, some of his entrails, I guess, but his insides, they were separated from his body. They were buried in front of his home here. So this is a little shrine to, and so he's partially buried there. Uh, that's the point of that, which I found interesting. So this is where he was shot. This is a chapel that was built. He began serving this religious community with masses before this was ever built. Again, it's a hospital, and the, the nuns work at this hospital. But he was having a mass at this, at this building, uh, this little chapel. Uh, this particular picture, so I'm standing on a cobble road there. The car that had the assassin, driven by somebody else, the assassin in the back seat, came up this road from what would be my left or our left, came up, did a U-turn so that it was exiting back out, and then pulled over and the driver got out and opened the hood, I guess, and was pretending it was broke down. Uh, and then, however, the assassin in the back seat was organizing himself. He, he had a shot through these doors to the, to the altar, uh, which is where Archbishop Romero was, was sitting. So very calculated, very whatever. So that's the, uh, that's the altar. And... Right up front, sorry. And that may make me squeal, we'll see. So he would have been standing just on the other side of the altar here. This is a little bit of a plexiglass. They have like a chalk outline of his body where it fell. Uh, but this is where he, he was having mass. And I have a picture from the exact location. Second, I'm gonna click and there's gonna be a song. So everywhere we went, since this was a, a pilgrimage, and retreat. Everywhere we went, we ended up doing, uh, we did masses, and we did mass here, and we, we did divine office, our liturgy of the hours, our prayers, and then at the holy sites, we would sing, sing this little song, uh, so just to give an idea. So this is where he would have been standing. I'm standing on the back side of the altar. Uh, maybe he would have been a little closer in and probably centered on the altar. I think the way the impact of the bullet was, he probably had the vessels. He just finished his homily, uh, and he turned probably like this to reach the vessels because the shot was kind of at a little bit of an angle. Uh, and like I said, it just exploded into his his chest, and and he bled profusely and passed and died. So then we went to, uh, this is Plaza, Plaza Libertad, actually, uh, and this, the whole Rosario Church is here. Just, to, But we went to the cathedral, and inside the cathedral, his body was initially laid over to the side here, uh, and his funeral was there at, at the cathedral. Beautiful cathedral. As is the case in a lot of these kinds of cities, you have the cathedral, and then just across the square would be the government buildings, which is an interesting juxtaposition since the church became the enemy of the state, in a sense, through all of this. <laughs> so then his tomb. So this is where his tomb is, and you can look at the, at the top of his headstone there is his motto, Sentir con la Iglesia, uh, and where he's laid to rest. A number of pilgrims were in there that morning. And that's uh, Lance Nado, who's the, uh, he, he's the uh, superior general of the Marinoles now. He happened to go along with us, and he was just giving, giving our first mass there, uh, a, a reflection that he had, I'm just realizing how much time I've used on just the first stop here, but so a reflection he had a little bit later is he said what kept coming to his mind, and this is after we visited several martyr sites, is he reflected on the words of Jesus where he said, nobody takes my life, but I lay it down of my own will kind of thing. And I don't remember the exact scripture passage, but nobody takes it, I lay it down. And for Father Lance, he was essentially thinking, am I laying my life down? So in other words, as we, talked, as we started with, right, when we find who we are and we say yes to that, and then we find our vocation and we go, we're laying down our life, we're choosing to live that out in whatever sacrificial way or not sacrificial way we choose, uh, it's not just taken from us. And I thought that was an interesting reflection, and it speaks to all the stories that we, we move through here. Uh, 
Okay, so I'm going to turn the page a little bit. This is the Salvadoran women. So there were four Salvadoran women killed that year in December. Two Mary Knoll uh, religious, nurse line religious, and then a, a lay person. So Ida, Jean, Ida and Mora, Ida Ford and Mora were the Mary Knolls. The Ursuline uh, was Dorothy, and then Jean, you hear, uh, was the lay, uh, lay person that was along. So this is where their body was dumped. Just And, and I took this picture just... You know, it's just a nondescript kind of jungle area uh, where their bodies were dumped. And then uh, the other pic, the sub picture here, this is a church that has just recently been built. There's a kind of a memorial here. This person here I'm going to talk about in a minute. So that's Father Paul Schindler. Father Schindler was there from 72 to 82, including when the women were killed. He was the pastor of the parish where two of them were uh, worked out of. Uh, and he had a lot of stories to tell I'll share here in a second. So Father Schindler from the Diocese of Cleveland. And this is where I started connecting. It's like, you're kidding, what, the Diocese of Cleveland? What the heck are you doing down here? But that's what happened because of Vatican II, in a sense. Uh, so those are those. This is sort of the, uh, the pictures of the four and just a little monument uh, there to the four women. And then, again, Father Schindler... Ray Van Pelt, one of the deacons that was on. So Father Schindler uh, talked about, so the first job as they went there a lot was to build up these communities. They'd build up what they called base communities of local leaders and parishes. So it was all about, all about training people to be catechists and training them to be delegates of the word, they called them, or animators of the faith, uh, just people that would take the Eucharist out, people that would do teaching, people that would hold prayer groups, that kind of thing. So it wasn't, we're going to have priests in every little chapel. There's too big an area to cover. We're going to train the laity in a sense. And that's what a lot of the work of these missionaries that went down was to do that. So they trained leaders and built these base communities uh, all across um, the thing. And then he was really close to Gene Donovan and Dorothy. So those two were working out of his parish the night before, actually, their death. They were meeting with the ambassador, the United States ambassador to, to Salvador, because they noticed all these helicopters coming in from Honduras. And the trick was the helicopters, our U.S. military wasn't supposed to be in Salvador. So they parked in Honduras and flew over back and forth. So they were kind of getting around the rules. And so they were just kind of talking to the ambassador about that. Uh, so they had that meeting at night. Then the next morning, they went to the airport to pick up Mora and Ida, who were uh, at a Maradona leadership meeting in Nicaragua, actually. Um, but they never really connected. And at the end of it all, what it turns out is they got to the airport. Those two were arrested, and then the two that were coming out of the, out of the airport were arrested. All four were taken to Miraflores, which was a uh, death squad uh, camp. And so they were tortured, raped. And then that night, they were dumped in that field where, where we were talking about, uh, where I showed the picture of. So, yeah, Miraflores, and then dumped there, and then actually they were just dumped, and then the next day some other soldiers went and actually did the burial, uh, which was their downfall, because somebody witnessed a part of that, and word got around pretty quick, and so everybody went out to where they'd been buried. You actually saw it on the news, and there's a lot of film coverage of it, because there were a lot of news outlets in the area at the end of November, there was a uh, there were like six people killed that were uh, opponents, leadership of the opposition party. So there was a lot of uh, news outlets in town, so it got covered really, really good. So getting back to Father Paul, though, uh, before we move on. So the stories he told, and this started just kind of making sense to me in a, in, in a weird way. But he talked about... They, he has a parish, and you have all these villages. People are being killed. People are being disappeared. Massacres are happening, and you're a priest that's pastor and responsible. And a lot of those people killed and disappeared were people you were training to be catechists because the last thing that a few people with power want is power bases rising up, right? So you're training led, uh, people to be leaders in Catholic parishes to do catechesis and stuff. So that's, that's uh, creating a, a potential opponent in a way. So anyway, so the last thing they want is any organizing. So that's why the church becomes really a focal point of a lot of their, their violence. So we'll talk about a handful of priests that were killed. It may be 13 in Guatemala, 20 over the two civil wars, 20 in Salvador, four religious and the archbishop. So 
serious and it's, it's a sadness, hundreds of catechists, hundreds of animators of the faith, delegates of the word were, were killed and disappeared. Anyway, so he's the pastor in this church. So what do you do? Well, it turns out what they would do is they would, they would go out to the villages, they'd talk to everybody, they'd collect the information, they would minister where they could minister, then they would go try and find the bodies, they would go back to the jails where these people potentially would, were, and they'd knock on the door and they'd confront the military uh, and ask them, have you seen, you know, Jose? He's been disappeared. No, 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 we haven't seen him. They had relationships with people that worked in the, in the jails, so from time to time they'd know they were in there. So they'd kind of play it close to the vest, but they'd more or less accuse. Uh, <clears throat> this particular gentleman talked about going over El Mirador was a cliff that, on the ocean, uh, on the edge. They would throw bodies. Well, they would rappel down. They would rope down. They would burn the bodies, collect the bones and the ashes, and bring them back up so the families had something to bury, identify the remains. Uh, people told him all the time, you know, you're going to die. You're on a list. And it was like, don't care. <laughs> We're here, we love these people, this is our community, and essentially they'd, they'd stick with it. So he was there, like I said, from 72 to 82 <clears throat> when they made him, made him leave. Uh, and then he said that was what he feared most that whole time was they'll make me leave, and they did end up making him leave. But what he did say was uh, when he left, they replaced him with two. When Ida, Ida was killed, when Mora was killed, they replaced him with two. The message being we will not, you know, we will still be here. We will not run. We will multiply. Um, so it's just fa powerful testimony to a guy that's, yeah, has a hard time getting around now, but he can, he can still tell the stories and witness to what happened uh, and how it happened there. How are we doing so far? Make sense? All right. So quick slide. You know, and this is what I say, this yes to our existence, saying yes. And these are all martyrs, right? So Dorothy, Mora, Jean, and Ida, all martyrs. And we recognize them as martyrs. Uh, in the case of Stanley Rother and others, blessed or even saints. But it's not the death, really, that we're witnessing to. And, and you'll hear this a little bit later. It's really the life. It's the love that they lived out for others. And you read these, these quick quotes. Most of us feel we would... We would want to stay here. We wouldn't want to just run out on the people. If we were abandoned, if we abandoned them, then we are suffering. When they are suffering the cross, how can we speak credibly about the resurrection? Several times I have decided to leave El Salvador. I almost could, except for the children. I truly believe that I should be here, and I can't even tell you why. All I share with you is that God's palpable presence has never been more real. Uh, so this is who they were. So they stayed and they paid the price. We went to another little church. It's, uh, uh, it was, uh, the pastor there was Co Cosme Spesotto, so a Franciscan Italian, <coughs> excuse me, St. John the Baptist Parish in St. Juan Noalco down there. And this wonderful little lady named Idalia gave us a, a, a tour. And it went on and on and on and on. And I, I'm going to kind of cut to, cut to the chase. But it was this same 24-7, 365, absolute commitment to everybody in his parish boundaries. <laughs> this man was everywhere always, and he would confront the police, uh, go to the jails like, like uh, Father Paul did, contact the police, the army, anybody and everybody trying to figure out if somebody was disappeared, try to get them back. Sometimes they would successfully, uh, successfully sometimes they did not. Uh, but just a powerful presence uh, and a wonderful man. Grew grapes where grapes shouldn't have grown, made wine out of these grapes. Just a personality plus kind of guy and committed to the people of Salvador. Uh, and then at some point, uh, he ends up, he had just done a mass, uh, the altars to the left here, and he was standing about here. Again, there's a plexiglass someplace, and a couple of guys with machine guns came in this store and machine gunned him down. Uh, yeah, he was too much of an example for others to follow, so he had to pay. And so we just, we spent some time saying our Holy Ground song there. An interesting uh, thing, this next slide. So this is kind of a testimony of his. It's in Spanish, but it says, it says, attention in case of improvised death, whatever that means. I have a feeling that from one moment to another, fanatical people can take my life. I ask the Lord to give me strength in the opportune moment to defend the rights of Christ and of the church. 
Dying a martyr would be a grace that I do not deserve. To wash with the blood poured out by Christ all my shortcomings, defects, and weaknesses of the past life would be a free gift of, from the Lord. Here's the part that matches up with Romero. In advance, I forgive and ask the Lord for forgiveness of the perpetrators of my death. I thank all my parishioners who with their prayers and their expressions of appreciation have encouraged me and give them the last witness of my life, this last witness of my life, so that they too may be good soldiers of Christ. I hope to continue helping you from heaven. <laughs> so he forgived in advance those people that he knew would, would end up killing him. Uh, and then his Italian family wanted him home, but he, he said, no, my, my parish is my family, and so that's why you saw that his, his tomb was there. Uh, but that, so just pausing there for a moment, so uh, Father Paul, Cosime, and others, when I talked about Vatican II, this, these are all expressions, these are beautiful stories of individual choices made, but what to me, and then afterwards a lot of the priests and deacons, when we were reflecting, said we were really kind of proud of the church, and sometimes it's, you know, we don't have those. Anyway, we were very proud of the church uh, back in the day for making this cognate this choice to send missionaries to do what was done in, in Central America. It's, pretty, it's an amazing story, this idea of solidarity with the poor, this idea of the body of Christ alive. Um, this is a, a wall. I won't turn on the sound. So the 75,000 people that were killed, they kind of have this memorial wall in San Salvador, and so 35,000 of the names are on this wall. And so we went down and just visited the wall. Again, all non-combatants just civilians that were caught in the crossfire in a sense. So you see on here there's Rutilio Grande's name is here. Uh, Archbishop Romero's was somewhere. Uh, they were there. So then at night, we watch videos and do other things. At night, this particular night, these are Mary Knoll missioners. So Mary Knoll still has a present. These are lay people. He has a wife, so this was a couple, and these were single, or this was a single guy. This, this guy now is married to a woman. I think they have a couple of babies in Salvador, but they're all Mary Knoll missionaries. So the Mary Knoll mission, if you will, is still alive, uh, and we got to hear stories of, of their exploits there and, and why they were there and that sort of thing. Uh, so turning to the next thing, this is at the UCA, the University of Central America. Uh, so the UCA the Jesuit University was kind of at the center of this consciousness raising, if you will, in a sense, this idea that Poor people should realize that they have the same inherent dignity <laughs> as, as wealthy people, that, that, that they are the image and likeness of Christ just as everybody else is. There's a really wonderful quote in a, by, a, by a Salvadoran uh, in a video about Archbishop Romero. He says, hey, look, we never heard the stories of the Bible. We never heard scripture before Vatican II. Vatican II came, we heard the scriptures, we heard homilies, and they told us that the Jews had been enslaved, the Jews had lived lives of poverty, God didn't want them to live like that. God sent them Moses to liberate them. We should be liberated. So there's this, 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 this consciousness raising, is the only way I can say it, uh, that was going on uh, after Vatican II. And, and so uh, this powerful yuk uka was a big part of that. The Jesuits, but all the priests that were down there were doing the same thing, raising up these communities. So here we talked to Jean Palumbo, uh, and Jean was a member of the press corps back in the day and has since uh, worked at the University of Central America and just told a lot of stories of the history of the UCA uh, and what all happened there. Um, the trick with what, like at the university where they were talking about, the university rebranded itself in a sense, so they wouldn't teach agriculture unless agriculture was going to feed people, right? There was this connection between what the university did and a pastoral result or a, a result that was positive for integrated human development would be the fancy term, right? So the university didn't exist in and of and for itself in an academic sense. It, it went somewhere with that. It, it, it uh, integrated human development. It raised people up. And, and uh, pastorally, that's what a lot of these priests were doing. Pastorally, they were out doing the pastoral work at the different parishes lifting people up. So there was a complementarity between the university system and what it did, and then the pastoral activities of people like Rutulio Grande and then the Archbishop Romero, all around trying to make sure people had, had justice, uh, were served justice. And one of the comments that uh, 
he made, <laughs> Mr. Palumbo, Gene Palumbo made was, you know, the thing was we began teaching this and, and began sharing this and people believed it and people started raising up a little bit. Uh, and that's where the violence, um, to push that back in a sense. So just a picture of the back. And then this is, there were six University of Central American Jesuits, six Jesuits that were on staff. They were all killed. And then two people that were there, it was their uh, housekeeper, cook, and then her daughter. So there were eight total. Uh, and many of them were dragged out onto this lawn. So there's a plaque out there and sort of these, these banners that, that show. And then this is down from that park. This is the little apartment off to the side. That plaque has the housekeeper's name and her daughter's name on it. This is where they were living at the time. And then they're all buried just right next to that there at the Uka. Uh, these are their uh, crypts, if you will, for their remains. But always, you know, I don't want to lend the impression that the University of Central America or other than this idea that they were leftists and they were raising up the guerrillas or whatever. That, th this is where it gets really complicated. They would fight for justice. They wanted reconciliation. They wanted peace. And they tried to be mediators between the conservative, the oligarchs, the leadership, and then those that were leftists and were actually fighting the battle from, uh, from a leftist position, right? So insurgents and things. But the, the church stayed centered uh, and uh, tried to fight for justice and everything along the way. I think that's an important distinction, but honestly, it gets really, it gets really cloudy. It gets really difficult to follow. Uh, in the end, they were killed. This is in 1989. So 1980 was Archbishop Romero. This is 1989 when they're killed. Uh, all through the 80s, there were peace negotiations back and forth, and especially Elia Curia, one of the instructors, one of the leaders of the UCA, was especially prominent in all of those. Uh, they're killed in 1989. Uh, the leftists actually, uh, the guerrillas did take over like a third of the city. Uh, and so the right, uh, the military decided, you know, we're going to have to make the Uka pay for this in a sense. So they surrounded the Uka and they went in and they killed these guys. Um, so anyway, this is a little, this is Rutilio Grande. He's just, it was, he was Jesuit. And so at the Uka, they have this little um, bit of stuff dedicated to him uh, in the museum. I won't say anything more about him. He he was doing that consciousness raising and, and stuff in, in Aguilares and Paisnal, which is where he was from. He was shot with an automatic weapon. All but one round, 13 rounds, went into his chest, so it was a pretty accurate, um, so they're assuming military. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, Archbishop Romero did after Rutilio was killed, the next Sunday he closed all the parishes. He didn't, it, nobody could have a mass except for at the cathedral. He had the Misa Unica, the, the unified mass. Everybody came from the outlying areas to the cathedral for the one mass for Rutilio and the two others that were shot. Um, some say that he was never forgiven for that in a sense. So that was what we did in Salvador. So we went to those places and heard about those people. This is Guatemala. So just a little Guatemala shot that's Antigua is where we stayed uh, they, uh, at the, uh, uh, whatever it's called, I forget the name for it. So then the first place we went, there's going to be two places back to back. I'm going to try and expedite. San Lucas Toliman and then, and then Santiago Atitlan. So San Lucas and, and Santiago. So there was two priests. So this priest was Father uh, Greg Schaefer. And Father Greg was from Minnesota and went here in the mid-60s or whenever it was, was when the mission was established down there. And then Santiago Atitlan was out of Oklahoma. Father Rother went there a little bit later, but it was started in the mid-60s also. What was just incredible about visiting these places and listening to some of the stories was they, they, they raised up these communities. There was everything from hospitals to schools to orphanages to Father Greg, actually, when, when the violence got so rough that some of the landowners abandoned their coffee farms, he negotiated with them and bought it, and then he gave it to the, to the poor people that owned it before. And so <clears throat> even today, they have this coffee, ongoing coffee concern. They sell their, their coffee to uh, Minnesota, so, to some outlets in Minnesota. But there was so much more. This community is just alive and vibrant with social services, in a sense, supporting the people. Uh, because of activities, this guy started back in the 70s, actually. He's, I think he was 70. Um, 
Anyway, it was just a fantastic story of, of a diocese in the U.S. sending priests, in particular this priest that was there over 40 years. He, he ended up coming home and he died of cancer. Uh, but just changing the way the community worked and thought, and even through all the violence. Now, who witnessed to the violence is this woman. <laughs> so this is Chona, Don, Doña Chona. And then I have that inset picture of... Uh, the deacon there, we, we all, a few of us asked her for her blessing. We just loved her. So she, her husband was disappeared when she was 31. She had three kids and her husband was disappeared. She later adopted four others, so she ended up having seven kids. So after her husband's death, she said she never slept in the same house twice. She was out of fear. She just kept moving. She helped Father Greg start a charity for widows and orphans, and on his deathbed, she went to visit him on his deathbed. He said, keep taking care of the children. She still takes care of the children. Uh, so she had a little shop we bought some stuff in and stuff. But she told a few just, just heroic stories. So there was one story where she headed north several hours. It would have been several hours north, uh, Quiche. And there were 11 kids from two families that were now orphans, and they were in Quiche. And Father Greg wanted her to go get them and bring them back so they could live in the orphanage. And she's like, Father, that's, you know, however far away it is, I'll never make it. And he's like, no, you're a strong woman. You'll be fine. Tell them you're, they're your kids and whatever. So she, so she does. She goes, she goes up, gets these 11 kids. She's 31. Two of the kids are a year and a year and a half old. She's 31, and she's got these 11 kids in the car. And these are my kids. We're her kids. Yes, we are. So she, they did get stopped a couple of times coming back, and they stuck with the story, and she made it back with these 11 kids. Uh, we were at a fiesta in Quiche. We're going home. So she tells the story. So she had, uh, she was in Santiago Atitlan when Father Rother was killed, actually. But there was a lot of tension in, in Santiago Atitlan. So they're pretty close to each other. So there was one native priest, a Guatemalan priest, that was under threat there after Father Rother was killed. So she dressed him in her father's clothes. And, and they laid him in the back of a car and told the police that they were taking him to the hospital somewhere. Anyway, they snuck him out of town dressed as her father. Uh, and then she did the same thing with a bunch of nurse, or, uh, uh, religious, a bunch of sisters. She uh, dressed them all in her clothes, and then they left as if you know, they were just people going somewhere. So helping people escape and, and avoid the violence, just story after story after story. Uh, and then she, yeah, she helped clean up a lot of the blood from Blessed Stanley Rother and recovered actually the, the spent rounds that were the, the, the ammunition that, that was there. So, Doña Chona. And, I, and I'll just, just to reiterate, it was people like her by the hundreds that were killed by the hundreds. So we, you know, anyway, sad. So this is the lake at Santiago Atitlan. It's deeper than Ponderé. I forget how deep it was. I looked it up at one time. It's a very deep lake. We had shrimp, nice, big, beautiful shrimp that were out of the lake. So how that happens, I don't know. But it's a beautiful spot. Uh, and this is the, where the village that Stanley Rother was at. Uh, this is actually uh, where he was killed. So on the on picture on the left, there's a, there's a bullet hole. You can't really see it there, and there's actually some stained blood there. And so it's right here in this room that now is a little bit of a shrine. He was staying in different rooms in the, in the church, in the rectory, because he knew they were coming for him. Uh, he'd been back in the States because he was on a death list, but he came back and, and then was killed. He came back for Holy Week, I think, so whatever. That was Marchish, and this is July uh, in 81, that, that he was killed. I think 81, right, Kathy? Kathy's our expert. Okarchi, Oklahoma. Are you out there? <laughs> she must have left. Oh, there you are. Okay, 81. So, uh, and Kathy just got back from visiting the brand new basilica they built for him. So we spent time in Santiago Atitlan. Uh, this room uh, is kind of, like I said, a little bit of a shrine. I think I have a picture of us doing some music in there the next morning. His heart... Uh, is still with the people, literally. It's in that shrine that's in the church, in the sanctuary itself. Uh, his body is in, in Oklahoma. Uh, this is kind of the parish, and I, this is a very intentional picture. Uh, so this is, we slept on the floor in the, in the rectory. It's, it's a big rectory. This is, we were watching a movie upstairs. Just, it was just over the top where, that, where he would have been killed, just above. So he would have been killed right below here. So we're sleeping around. We're watching the movie here. And then the movie is over on this side. This side was where we ate with the pastor and some of the staff. 
Uh, and then we were doing, they did this music thing. This was a friend of his, or wrote some ballads about him anyway, and knew him uh, in that room. But the point of the picture is that, and this was a reflection of one of the Paulist fathers, Father Mike, that was with us. Here is, there was a man martyred right there. So we are a church of martyrs. That man was shot, killed, <laughs> in this place. But here we are a number of years later, and the church goes on. We're the church of the resurrection. So we're the life in the church. There were six masses in this sanctuary uh, the next day, starting at like six in the morning. The sanctuary was full of Tutsuhil, their indigenous Mayan predominantly people, filled it starting at six in the morning, six masses. Absolutely, they had 60 people that went out and took communion to people Saturday night after the Saturday night mass. We all doubled up with them and went and prayed over people. Uh, the next day when we sort of concelebrated mass together, they gave us these little stoles. There I am with some of the altar servers. Uh, but we did mass together. But the church itself is alive and vibrant. So we're standing there where this man was killed, martyred, and yet resurrection. And that was the uh, juxtaposition that Father Mike noticed. It was beautiful. Um, in miniature, I'll give you in miniature a little bit of that. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to keep going. I looked at the time. Peace Park, 1990, a bunch of people were killed. Uh, they, did a, they did a protest, and then <laughs> military, they went down, they protested going down to the military. Military opened fire and killed several. <clears throat> this one man is on the uh, committee that's helping with the, uh, um, with the canonization of Father Rother. Uh, anyway, he told the story of the Peace Park. He was there. Uh, they threw the military out. So in 1990, after this massacre in the park, they literally threw the military out. They have not been back uh, since. So this town that was under siege by the military in the time of Father Rother in 81, in 1990, the people are coming together to throw them out. That kind of tells the story of how these communities changed, both the one I talked about with Father Schaefer and Santiago Atitlan. So that night, or along the way, we uh, sat with these ladies. This is uh, Sister Sylvia and Sister... Uh, Bernice Kita, she wrote a book, and just heard their stories. She's, uh, Sister Sylvia still lives in Guatemala, uh, and she, she told a lot of stories. They, they went up and down the rivers and, and were with people, and she told several about personal relationships where people were killed. Sister Bernice didn't tell many stories because she has this book. She wrote letters like a fiend, and uh, her superior said, you should write a book. She said, I'm not a book writer. I'm just a lady that writes letters. And she said, isn't that what St. Paul was? <laughs> so, so her letters are now in, in print. And I had a couple of passages that I had marked. I'll, uh, I'll maybe look at one of them. So on the life and death topic, two more priests have disappeared and one more was killed since I last wrote you on the subject. Father Pelissaire a young Guatemalan Jesuit was in his car in front of the church, the Jesuit staff in Guatemala City, when he was approached by armed men. They beat him, dragged him from his car, shoved him into an unmarked one, and took him off. He joined the ranks of the disappeared. Um, the disappearance occurred in the center of the city, in broad daylight, a block from the National Palace. There were many witnesses. Although his kidnapping was, provoked a furor, he's still missing. So she just has letters over letters. Some of them are day-to-day -day mundane things, but a lot of them are about the violence and about what happened during her time there. Um, so. Sister Sylvia and Sister Bernice, more first-hand witnesses. Um, and Sister Bernice, she actually was around Santiago Atitlana, around the lake. Uh, that's where she served, so she knew Father Rother. He came to her installation. So we watched more. This room was a really nice long room, but at this end of it, up at this end, there was a screen. So we watched several videos of other martyrs from the time. Bill Woods, um, a fabulous story. Father Dave told his story, actually. Um, and Father Dave ended up uh, having to, he left. Uh, and I think it still haunts him. He said it still haunts him. He left in 82, went to Nicaragua till 84, and then had to leave because of depression. Something he shared, so I guess I'll share it. Uh, which I'm sure must have been just really difficult on a lot of people. Uh, anyway, so we heard all those stories. I'm going to blaze through Father Girardi real quick, or Bishop Girardi. So he's killed in 1998. To give you a, the idea of the span of time, Bishop Girardi uh, in Guatemala, 
So the war closes out in 92, I think, is when the peace uh, things are signed. A couple of years afterwards, they're, they're talking to the UN. UN's going to do a truth commission. UN's going to publish a report. UN says, we're going to spend six months and we're going to write this up. 200,000 people were killed in 636 massacres. You're going to take six months and unwind that. Seems a little short in, in uh, the bishop's uh, estimation. He formed a human rights commission within the church, sent people out. They did like 6,000 interviews, spent several years, three years, I think, and then they published uh, Guatemala Nunca Mas, which was all the details, gave it to the UN Truth Commission, said, here's, here's some background for you. So he went through all that uh, and then stood up and published it, and two days later he was assassinated. There's a great movie about it called uh, The Art of Political Assassination that tells the story. So this is the garage where he pulled into his garage in his rectory. He would have parked right here. Uh, that's kind of a stanchion where he was uh, found at the foot of the stanchion, just where he's buried. Um, that, that mural that showed up earlier, it's a series of murals that kind of tells the history of Guatemala. She was from the Human Rights Office that still exists to this day, and she walked us through the mural. This is looking into the garage. That's that pillar that he was at, that he was, he was killed by. Um, so very sad. So that's 1998. So now we're talking 25 years ago, right? And violence spanning from 77 when Rutilio was killed to 98. So 22 years of, of violence. Just sad and tragic. Ricardo Falla, so I say it gets complicated. This, it gets really complicated. So he's a Jesuit with, a, with an odd past. Uh, great guy. Uh, anthropology PhD from Houston. Uh, came back to Guatemala and decided to... So three things happened in northern Guatemala. You had a choice to make. So you could stay where you were in your village, especially Mayan. You could stay in the village. And then you, you had the bad guys and you had the bad guys. So you, you were just stuck between the middle of them. There's another book I was, that has some passages highlighted. What war? And it says, what war? Because they didn't really know there was a war. They just knew they were the bad guys and the bad guys, and we were stuck in the middle. And they constantly suffering violence from the guerrillas or from the military. Uh, so you either stayed put and were struck between them, or you went to the big city, or you went to Mexico and were a refugee in Mexico. Many did. Or you joined a CPR, so a Community of Popular Resistance, a CPR. And so that's what he's diagramming up here. He joined, he ministered to people in the CPRs that chose to stay as population and resistance. So you had guerrilla forces that actually fought the military, and you had the military. Kind of in between, you had these, <laughs> these popular resistance, which were just communities of Mayans that were displaced from their homes, did not want to go to Mexico, so they just kind of lived it out in the jungle, in and out of canyons, in and out of mountains. They'd run from the military. They were fleet of foot. They kept connected through a network of just intelligence, essentially just talking to each other. Fleet of foot, the military had to move really slowly because they'd get ambushed by the guerrillas if they tried to chase too fast. So the, <laughs> it was this cat and mouse game of the military. The CPR would, would uh, kind of goad them, in, goad them into chasing them and then they'd move away, and the, the guerrillas would come in and, and do a battle with them and go off. So were they guerrillas? No. But were they, but they were supporting, right? And uh, Father Ricardo here would say, well, was it, he, he looked at it as a just war. He was just there to minister to the sacraments and everything with these communities of resistance. So is he, anyway, it's just a fascinating tale of who's guilty of what, in a sense. Uh, so, but he spent several years with the uh, CPRs and, and came out of it alive, obviously. Uh, he said that, you know, bap he did baptisms to remind them that they were children of God, not animals, as they were called. And I did hear that the Mayans in northern uh, Guatemala were called monkeys without tails, was kind of what they called them. Um, they ate sacraments to give them strength. Uh, and then he trained, same thing, animators of the faith. They carried tabernacles with hosts in them. If they couldn't bring in hosts, some of the women would make uh, kind of these corn hosts out of corn. Uh, he said some Jesuits, some uh, did join guerrillas, right? Uh, he did not. Uh, so Father Ricardo Faya. Uh, there was another guy that mentioned, oh, it was Father Dave. He said that they did 300 confessions in a week or something. So that's that. And I'm going to... I hate to skip this part. So I also, so I closed out my time with the Mary Knowles and I went north. We have some parishioners with a, uh, with a uh, 
mission in a little town called Shahul. Uh, if I go back to that original picture, that's Shahul down in the, we, we did a hike up here. And this is kind of their mission. They have a sewing co-op and these are just pictures of the village. So I went there for an extra five days and just spent time with, you know, checking in on their mission. Uh, the men of that group want to become bird guides. Uh, so we'd given them, the parish had given them some supplies for bird guiding. Actually, some parishioners gave some direct donations. Uh, and so I just spent five days with them. That's some of the bird guides. We were up there on that mountain. This is a Mayan uh, holy site, if you will, that was up on that mountain. This is mass, and this is their gifts. It's all food. And the priest actually thanked them at the end because said, look, if you don't bring that, I don't eat. So a little different. This, is, this was a martyr site. So Father Gran and his sacristan. A lot of times you hear about the priest and his sacristan. The priest and his sacristan was killed. This was quite an honor to be given the key so we could go up and visit this site uh, and spend time. This was another Mayan site that they took us to, an ancient sort of, I, I say ancient, it's been there forever, but they still light candles and pray there, and just the guys of the village. So I had, I, I had a really, yeah, time there. So this is, so now on my phone I have these two pictures. So all of that kind of stayed with me heavy. That's a lot of heavy information. <clears throat> trying to figure out, yeah, what, what do I think of all that? What was the military's role? What was the United States' role? What was, you know, the church's role in all of this? These civil war, all of it, let alone just the pain and suffering of the hundreds and thousands that have been killed. Uh, it's a lot to digest. On my phone, this is out of Father Grand, that, that shrine that I just pointed to, because I did, this crucifix just stuck with me. This, this crucifix, it just reminds me that, you know, we are to... Our lives as Catholics are self-sacrificial, is what I would say there. We carry our crosses. We burden ourselves with not just our challenges, but the challenges of others, our neighbors, wherever they may be. So this idea of, of burdening ourselves or having carrying our crosses. This is our mission in Honduras, uh, which uh, we did a water project. So these people have water at their house, which is just phenomenal and an unknown. But for me, it was uh, the reason I have these together on my phone is this idea of death and resurrection, this idea of the darkness and the light and how they go together. And we take, we take the good with the bad. Uh, we literally changed this village. This parish and St. Thomas have changed this village to the point that they changed their name to Nueva Consolacion, New Consolacion. They see themselves as new. When we first went there, they said, we were, we were hate, you made us love. Why do you visit us? We're the bad people. We change them just by being there with them, by loving them into existence. So by accepting their burdens, in a sense, as our own, by seeing them, by acknowledging their humanity, you know, we, we gave them life as they have not had it in the past. Not so much different than Santiago Atitlan or San Len Lucas Toliman or any of the other villages where these missionaries went, uh, albeit we haven't faced the, the violence and all of that. Make sense? All right went really fast. This is a video. It's eight minutes, I think. I took, two, I took some clips. It's John Sabrino. John Sabrino's a Jesuit that left the Uka to go to Thailand for a couple of weeks, and all his friends were killed. <laughs> so he came back and has been there or was there afterwards, and he talks about martyrdom and his friends. Then it's a guy named Bill. Uh, I just went blank on Ford. So Bill Ford. Bill would eat his brother. Ida Ford, who was one of the Salvadoran women killed, her brother was a, uh, an attorney in D.C., so a Beltway kind of attorney. He, the, uh, Salvador or our government, nobody was really interested in investigating who killed his sister, so he got it done. So he talks about his experience of coming to know Ida through that process. And again, it's about martyrdom, and it's just a beautiful tale. The last couple of minutes are about Father Stanley Rother and just some commentary on, on that. So it's worth, it's worth seven or eight minutes. I know we've gone over an hour. I'm going to play her. Hopefully it sounds okay. In November last year, Sabrina left for a Is lecture okay? tour in Thailand. The trip was to save his life. At the height of a major guerrilla offensive, a large group of soldiers raided the Jesuit quarters and murdered six of Sabrina's associates. The dead men were accused of instigating the guerrilla offensive. In fact, they were political moderates who'd encouraged dialogue between the government and guerrillas. Jesuit's cook and her daughter were also killed. I felt at the very, very beginning that life and I myself was absolutely unreal. That I had lost all my relations uh, to the real world. So you can understand that I felt angry against uh, well, those who were responsible. But then simultaneously, these 
death of these Jesuits is good news because it tells us it is possible to be a human being on this earth. And to be human, not to be ashamed of living on this planet. The price to pay was terrible, of course. And that's the bad news. But, it's, you know, still, that's what I mean by good news. It is possible for us to be human believers and Christians.
probably realize how fearful he was because he was so intent on going back. But he had to be fearful because he knew what was happening. He would describe that if I'm ever kidnapped, they'll never get me out of the rectory alive. That was really chilling to know that those were the things that he dealt with every day. It had to have been a difficult decision, and yet on the other hand, not. Because he was so confident in God's providence. Everyone acknowledged he knew he needed to go back. Stanley's life was that parish and those people in that situation. And so being cut off from that parish was, I mean, that was killing for him. Again, if he'd stayed behind in Oklahoma where it was safe and, and watched from a distance while those people suffered, that would have been a life less for him than to go back and do what he needed to do to remain their shepherd. He didn't go back to Guatemala to die. He went back to Guatemala to live. I didn't know if that wasn't on. Anyway, <laughs> so they made that movie a year or two, the first clips, Reno and others, uh, 90 or 91. Uh, <clears throat> but just this idea that, uh, yeah, life and death, you know, uh, and, and the crucifix, when we look at the crucifix, is it, you know, sorrow and death and loss, or is it life and resurrection and joy? And he does a good job, I think, in that movie pointing out that the martyrdom is bad news, but there was good news in that these men and women loved. And they showed us what it was like to be fully human, as Christ himself showed us. Uh, the name of that movie, if you ever want to look at it, is Killing Priests is Good News. So that's, it's, you, can, you can see that one on YouTube. It's actually, that quote comes all the way back from uh, Archbishop Romero, who thought that if the people were suffering such that they were, wouldn't it be... A, a tragedy if no priests were killed was kind of his. The point he was making is that is that the church is the people and the people is the church. Uh, and so, anyway, complicated, right? As I say, very layered. That's it. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> Are, any, is there any questions before everybody, does anybody have a burning question that would like to ask in front of people? Yes. Yeah, he's a blessed, not, can, not, not a saint yet, but a blessed. Yeah, it's him. Yeah, Dano. Oh, that's a great question. No, I, you know, I don't know technically. Right? So I, I'm not going to give a church answer because I don't know what the church would say, right? We'd have to look that up somewhere. I would say no. Uh, yeah, I would say no. Martyr, the definite, martyr is witness. They witnessed with their life. So martyr really becomes witness. And if you're wis witnessing to Christ, you're witnessing to, you know, yeah, the faith, but witnessing to Christ, I would say, and you die in the process of that, you're a martyr. Uh, you know, you see a lot of them where they've suggested some of these, I think it was actually Sister Sylvia said that we should have uh, St. Archbishop Romero and companions for all those people that died alongside him. Uh, and now a lot of those were church people too. That's a great question. I don't know if I would say that or not. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that they, I don't think they get out of the, I don't know. I, they, I don't know that they get out of the present, right? They have, they have problems today, let alone to look back. Uh, so Salvador is now hugely challenged uh, over <laughs> gang problems and stuff that the current leader has just quashed. Uh, and we'll see how that all goes. Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't know how their governments look at it. 
I don't think any, I think it's different than here in that the people I do know in Honduras, as an example, they don't consider, they don't think about those things as much. They kind of write it all off like, yeah, whatever. They're doing whatever they're doing again this year. We have to figure out how to survive today. So maybe that'd be my answer. I don't know. All good. Thanks for listening. <laughs>